Hello everyone, um, my name is Grace Hahn, and uh, like Emily, I was a junior Fulbright research grantee for the past year. Um, a lot more people came than I thought there would be, so um, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed Emily's presentation. Um, so my project is Henya Jeju in the Future of Marine Conservation. Um, if you don't know anything about Henya, that's fine. If you know everything there is to know about Henya, then I would like to talk to you. Um, but uh, um, So my background, um, I graduated in 2010 from Cornell University with a degree in biology focusing on marine biology and ecology. Um, I spent a semester in Hawaii in my junior year, and while I was there, um, I, I came to be introduced to the concept of traditional ecological knowledge. Um, this is knowledge that people have about their environment that isn't necessarily scientific, that it comes from either culture or from their own personal experience. Uh, and, and I thought, wow, that's so interesting, and, and I want to learn more about it. Um, and because I'm Korean American, I thought, well, what if Korea has something like that? And I came across a segment about, a segment about Henya who were diving women on um, largely on Jeju Island, and I thought, oh, that could be such a cool thing to learn more about. Um, and, and Fulbright gave me this wonderful opportunity to learn more about them. Uh, so I spent, um, my project is based on Jeju Island. Uh, it's, an, it's the largest island in Korea. It's located off the southern coast of the peninsula, and it's famous for being beautiful. <laughs> um, I put together a slide. Hold on. <laughs> I put together a slideshow for you guys. Um, just to sort of give you a taste of what Jeju looks like. Um, it's a very fast slideshow, so keep your eyes open. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's a volcanic island. Uh, it's known for its black rocky beaches and, and it traditionally has been a very hard place to live. Uh, it, most of the people there were subsistence farmers or subsistence fishermen. Um, and so it has a long history of, of harsh life, beautiful but harsh surroundings. Um, and on the mainland it's known as the island of wind, rocks, and women. Um, because all the men would die when they go fishing. Uh, but it's famous for its ecological biodiversity. It's um, the Mount Hala, which is currently the tallest mountain in Korea, is um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site specifically because it has such a wealth of species. Um, and my interest is specifically marine biology, and I went, I was just blown away by how much there is and how beautiful it all is. I hope you get a sense of this from the slideshow. Um, so, but anyway. So, who are Henya? Um, they're also known as Ama, more in the international realm. Uh, and literally speaking, the, the word means sea women. And this is a more current word. It's not what people on Jeju used to call diving women. Um, traditionally, they're called Jamsu, Jamnya, or in the Jeju dialect, Jomsu, or Jomnya. And they literally mean diver and diving women. Um, so they're not mermaids. I want to make this absolutely clear. Uh, uh, there's a sort of romanticized image of these women being, oh, they're, they're women diving in the ocean, so they must be sexy and beautiful and have fins and breathe underwater. Um, in actuality, uh, they, they're incredibly strong women, but they're ordinary people. Um, they're known for diving underwater for things like abalone, which is what this woman here is doing. Um, like, uh, this is a group of women, Henya, uh, from Haro Village, which is where I spent a good deal of my research project. Um, and they catch things like seaweed. So on the top, does this work? This is, this is, this is tot. Um, 
also known as Hezekiah fusiformis. This is Chonchou, or, or known as Umukasari in Korean, um, also known as Gladium and Mansi. Um, then this is Miok, uh, which many of you are probably very familiar with. Um, and in scientific language, it's Indaria pinnatifida, even though Henya don't really catch, they don't really collect Miok so much anymore because it's mostly farmed. Um, they also collect a lot of marine invertebrates. Uh, we have Sora here, turbid shell. Um, this is abalone. These are both abalone. Uh, this is um, sea cucumber. They don't catch sea squirt, but this is the best picture I had, so forgive me for that. Um, and these are sea urchins, and these are these are just among the products that they catch on a, on a large scale. Um, and I think they're probably most famous for being abalone catchers. Um, by the way, just a quick fun fact. Um, you, can, you can tell whether or not they're male or female based on upon their gonad color. Um, so this is green, so that's a girl. And this is kind of like a beige color, so it's a boy. <laughs> um, when Henya dive, they don't use breathing equipment. They don't use snorkel, they don't use scuba. And it's been this way basically for the whole entirety that they've been diving. Um, the tools of the trade are currently largely, they use a rubber suit, um, mask, fins, and weights. Um, and traditionally, they have also used float, which they call tewak, a net, mangsari. Um, and when they catch things like fish or, or um, try to go between cracks to also look for things, they use a spear or curved picks or sickles. Um, you can see here, this is a this is an example of the spear that I was talking, or not the spear, the, the curved pick or sickle that I was talking about earlier. Um, and the rubber suits aren't, they haven't been around, as you can well imagine, for all of entirety. Um, traditionally, actually, they used cotton clothes to dive, cotton shirts and cotton shorts and a headscarf. Um, and, and in the 70s, when rubber suits became more widely available, they switched over to rubber suits. But before that, um, it was very cold and difficult to dive with just cotton clothing. You could only go in for about two to three hours with about, like, you'd have to take breaks every 30 minutes, actually. Um, but with rubber suits, that day extended to just continuous six hours. Um, Today, the, or, so if you look at Henya population, in 1966, it was the peak at 23,081 divers. And today, there's only a little under 5,000. Um, and the, like, almost half of them are over 70 years old. Um, if you look at this age distribution, in 1970, half of them were between 30 to 49, so they were mothers. And that has sharply decreased to where all of them are, are old enough to be a grandmother, great grandmother. Um, and this is because no new henya are entering the trade. Young, when young women have stopped entering the trade, starting with around the 1990s, or in the 1980s actually. Um, my research project uh, focused largely on two topics. One was traditional ecolo ecological knowledge. So, how do Henya and their associates utilize their knowledge of the local marine ecology in their work and in resource management? Um, and the second area is resource stewardship. Um, how has the Henya community approached the idea of taking care of their resources in the past? How does the Henya community foresee the future of Jeju's oceans in the case of their being Henya and their no longer being Henya? And lastly, what role could Henya play in the future of Jeju's future marine conservation efforts. Uh, my methods were, I spent six months at Seoul National University taking language classes. Um, in addition, I spent a lot of time reading papers and, and books and, and articles on the internet. Um, I also spent a good deal of time with Henya, um, with fishing cooperative leaders and scholars through interviews and personal communication. And also I spent um, the last four months attending Henya School uh, on Jeju. So. Um, so, the technical defi definition of traditional ecological, ecological knowledge, um, probably by the founder of the field, Berkeys, is a cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations 
by cultural transmission about the relationship of living beings with one another and with their environment. So as I said before, people knowing about their environment through what they learn from each other and what they have really learned from their own experience. So Henya, um, just to give a sort of background on their traditional ecological knowledge in the literature, um, just in terms of ability, the recorded depths are 20 meters and they can hold their breath for over three minutes. But typically they work closer between five to six meters and one to two minutes. Um, it's dangerous <laughs> to always be diving that deeply. Um, and, and there's been documentation of their understanding of tides, of, of how the underwater topography and geography affects marine life, how the climate and weather and waves affects how they do their work, and also just how the ecosystem changes during the seasons. Um, furthermore, these women started really young, around the age of 9, 10, 11. Um, and, and just because these women are so old now, they have such a long experience in the ocean, over 50 years actually. Furthermore, it's a communal culture traditionally, so they spend a lot of time talking to each other and learning from each other, even though they don't necessarily trade secrets with each other. Um, there's a saying that a mom doesn't tell her daughter where to find the best abalone. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, and in my own research, uh, what I think has gotten very little attention so far is they have such a wealth of knowledge, just, just pure knowledge, of marine organisms, how they relate to each other, what they named, um, where you can find them, the ecology, how things change over time and over seasons. Um, and I think you could call this folk taxonomy. Uh, furthermore, their historical knowledge and understanding of how things have changed is, is incredible. Um, one is just spatial understanding. They have mental maps of what the ocean looks like underneath. It's kind of, it's amazing actually. Um, and because they've been doing it for so long, they have an understanding of how things have changed spatially, um, how species, populations, and how community underwater has changed, and furthermore, how the impact Oh, like they also have seen firsthand how local development has impacted the marine ecosystems. Um, and lastly, uh, they have, they used to have, it's not so much done nowadays, but they used to have communal cleaning where everyone in the fishing village had to go clean up the beaches. Um, uh, and furthermore, they have this concept of weeding. So because they have specific interests, like they want to catch abalone or they want to catch turban shell, they want to make sure that the things that they eat, so the seaweed that they eat, also grows in abundance. So they weed out everything else and just leave that there. Um, but I think these all reflect uh, how significant the knowledge and understanding they have is. Um, this is just a picture of all the different things that I took. This isn't actually that many in comparison to what is actually out there. Um, but uh, I spend a lot of time just on the beach and I'd be like, Grandmother, what's this? And grandmother was that. And grandmother was this. And every time they, they, they tell me, oh, that's chungak, or that's this, and that's sol, and that's tobak, and that's. And they had a name for everything. Um, and my knowledge of the marine species, it's not like, an, it's not expert. But what I did know in, in comparison to what they knew is I think in some respects theirs is more specific. Um, and of course, in other respects, not as specific. But uh, I thought that was really amazing. Um, so historically, what evidence is there of resource stewardship? Just to give some background, like I said before, it's a harsh environment, it's a difficult life. Uh, for much of history, there are subsistence fishing and agriculturalists. Um, and they also had to deal with heavy taxation by mainland and, and invading powers. Um, so they were busy with just staying alive. Um, and I, I, I think in my research, I haven't really found a direct concept of resource stewardship, like we can't overfish. Like I don't think that was too big a concept that came up. Um, however, they did have a, a rich, like they did have um, religious beliefs uh, that tied very closely to how they did their work. Um, so, for instance, shamanistic rituals to gods for safety and good harvest. This is a picture um, from Changsugut. Um, which is a spring ritual done every year where the henya gather and ask for safety and good harvest. 
Um, and furthermore, in the past century, there's been a lot of changes, both on Jeju and in Korea. Um, one of them is uh, the Joseon Dynasty ended. Um, and this is significant because this ended the taxation uh, that the Henya had to, had to give. They no longer had to catch these huge quotas of abalone for the monarchs. Um, and this allowed them, this freed them up to, to finally get to sell what they had, what they earned. Um, and a lot of Henya traveled to other places, to Japan, to Russia, to other parts of the mainland. And they went to sell, they went to sell their efforts and, and they were able to bring back money. Uh, this is significant because it was a really hard, this whole period was known by, by poverty and hardship and, and Henya were breadwinners in their families. These are women who were earning money for their families. Um, and this increased economic and educational opportunity and furthermore advances in technology introduced better goggles and rubber suits in the 70s. Uh, and um, this changed things dramatically. <laughs> so if you look here, this is 1966, um, where Henya their peak, and then you can see that there's a sharp decline. This is where women started pushing their daughters into doing other better work, to go to school, to not risk their lives all the time in the water, to work in factories or become teachers or whatnot. Um, and at the same time, Diving yields has changed over time. So in 1966, it's around a little less than 15,000 metric tons of yields of what they catch every year. Um, and it rises sharply in the 1970s because this is where rubber suits were introduced. Um, and then there's been a steady decline. And this, decl this decline has sustained even though the number of henya has, de has decreased dramatically. And I think this is indicative of damage to the marine environment. Um, and so fishery decline beginning in the 1970s, overfishing uh, is definitely something that everyone has mentioned to me, where um, increased workability due to rubber suits made people want to earn more, to provide more for their families, but at the same time, they're ruining their ecosystems. Um, furthermore, fish farms became a much more prevalent around in the 1980s and 90s. And, and the pollution coming off of these fish farms has damaged the local ecology as well. And furthermore, larger things like climate change um, has impacted how, like, what species you would find, including key species such as kamite, which is a seaweed that the hen you would always say, oh, this is what this is what the abalones and then the turban shell need. And it's disappearing, and this has contributed to the decline. Um, Current resource management uh, is communal, and it's under self-management, even though largely informed by uh, top-down policies. Um, they include no diving during breeding season. They don't dive during the summer months. There's catch size limits um, per species. So for instance, no abalone under 10 centimeters can be caught legally. Um, and furthermore, diving is limited to certain days of the month during neat tides. Um, and they have guard watches on the fishing grounds to prevent poaching. Um, in the future, in the future, what would happen without Henya? I asked this to a number of people, and I think these two opinions is pretty indicative of the diversity of opinions that there are. So the first one is um, Ko Young Sun. Uh, she was uh, she's a Henya who is also the fishing cooperative leader of her village, and she said that without Henya. Without Henya to keep overfishing, Jeju's oceans will recover. On the other hand, another fishing cooperative leader said, without Henya, who will be here to ensure that Jeju still has healthy oceans? Um, and this sort of like crucial moment in history right now is very well reflected in this diversity of opinion, where Henya have been sort of a cause of overfishing, but without Kenya there, they're worried that more that worse things will come in. Um, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, just to give a broader broader perspective, fisheries are degrading globally. Uh, in Korea alone, a significant decrease in capture production has been noted in the past 20 years. And this is actually one of the reasons why there's such heavy invest investing in aquaculture and fish farms. Um, and East Asia is really important to consider in all of this because 
China. China accounts for China alone accounts for 30% of, of consumption, and I think about 30% of capture production as well. Um, and Japan is, is closely behind. And altogether, Asia accounts for 60% of all fishing consumption in the world. 60%! Like when you look at food and agriculture, food and agriculture organization statistics, they have charts that have world and world without China. Um, like that's just how, what, how much of an impact China and Asia has. And worldwide, of the 200 principal world of marine fisheries in the world, 70% are fully exploited, depleted, or in the recovering stages from being in these stages. Um, so, like, I don't, I don't want to be like, uh, what is it, the, the, the crying wolf? No, I'm not on it. No, I'm not crying wolf at all. No, um, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but this is pretty bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so to bring it back to my own small humble project, uh, what what is Henya's role in future marine conservation? And these are just my personal um, suggestions uh, that actually a lot of people think I'm crazy for having. Um, but I think their historical ecological knowledge could be really crucial in establishing a baseline understanding of Jeju's marine ecology. Um, Korea doesn't have a very good scientific background in terms of the long term, uh, what the long term has looked like. There isn't that much scientific data. Um, and, and these women, they have intimate micro, they have intimate knowledge of the microhabitats all around Jeju because the coastline, each, ha like all of the coastline has fishing villages, or it used to. Um, and I think this could be really important. Um, furthermore, the folk taxonomy knowledge that they have, I think if this could be combined into some sort of field guide, particularly one that accounts for the Jeju dialect, it could have an immense value, not only just in terms of science, but also culture, because the Jeju dialect is dying as well. Um, and lastly, um, when I first came to Korea, I was sort of astounded because I saw things here that I saw back home. Except back home, these things were bad. Um, and here, they're good. So, like I said, this is meal. Um, this is chongga in Korean. Uh, and this is called chamke or, or crab. <laughs> um, and these are all sort of like locally these are all sort of very, uh, these are considered delicious foods in, in Korea. However, in the world, they're invasive species. Uh, Miyok is actually listed as one of the worst 100, in, it's, it's listed among the top 100 worst invaders in the world. Um, and, and I actually saw a lot of Kodium fragility, which is Cheonggak, and Hemigraxis sanguineus um, in my own research, in my own studies in the Northeast USA as well. Um, and I think uh, the Henya and just Jeju people and Korean people and their knowledge of how to eat foods and how to deal with foods, um, I think that could be really a very innovative way of approaching invasion biology in other parts of the world as well as an opportunity for culture exchange. Um, so that concludes my project. I, I have a lot of grateful acknowledgments. Um, firstly to Fulbright, um, to Mrs. Shim, and to everyone in the office for giving me this opportunity. I learned a lot. Um, my advisors, um, Dr. Sun at Chungnam National University, he helped me establish a bunch of contacts when I first came here, even though he didn't have anything to do with Henya. Um, and Dr. Gwon at Jeju National University and Dr. Cha at the, at the Henya Museum, they all sort of took me under their wing. Um, as well as Dr. Bu at Jeju National University. Um, the fishing cooperative leaders, um, Mr. Im, Mr. Im number two, uh, <laughs> and, and Mrs. Go, um, uh, as well as Dr. Ju, and, and, and I did an interview with Dr. Jet at the Korean Oceanic Research Development Institute. Um, and, and probably most importantly, to the Henya teachers from Hado Village and the Henya School of Kutogiri, and to my friends and family for their support. Um, that's a picture from Henya School. Uh, 
Thank you. about the Hania University. Could you tell us um, who goes to that university and how you can go to that university? I mean, if, I mean if, the, if the young people aren't going there, who is actually attending and what's the purpose of it? Okay. Uh, it's far from being a university, but it yes. is a school. It's, it's, so actually what happened was um, the Jeju provincial government wanted tourism ideas from the villages and this particular village offered the idea of Hania school as, as their thing, and they receive funding for it. Um, it's, when I went, it was the fourth year running. Um, and in the beginning, it actually was largely Jeju people, so uh, you have like Jeju women and, and men as well who are probably just doing it out of novelty. Um, even though now it's largely people from the mainland. Um, and I think what's interesting about Henya School is that it's not really a school. Um, and it's indicative of how, it, like, there, there weren't any, there weren't lectures. Literally, they just put us in wetsuits and told us to go into the water. And, and they had Henya swimming around with us. And, and the Henya would tell us to dive and dive more. And you're not diving enough, so why don't you dive again? <laughs> and, um, and, and, and this is sort of just how things have been, where women, women didn't have any other opportunities. So diving was what they just automatically would go into. If you if you were a woman if you're a woman in, in one of these fishing villages in the nineteen like say nineteen thirties, nineteen forties, like you'd become a henya. Um, and it actually like what some people have told me is it takes about two years to really become a henya because it takes a lot of time to, to learn what's out there, to learn yourself in the water and to also be able to catch things. Because that is hard. <laughs> um, uh, but if you would like to become a head, <laughs> um, first off, uh, it's it's still largely in Korean because it's a bunch of elderly Korean people trying to run a school, so their English skills aren't very good. But um, I can give you the contact information if you want. Okay. Um, also, if you wanted to become a henya. Uh, there's a bit of culture behind it, and you could only really enter the fishing cooperative if you were either the daughter-in-law or the daughter of a henya. Mm. And this has had a significant impact on henya entering the trade because the mothers don't want their daughters to become henya, and the daughters don't want to become henya. Um, and the people who do want to become henya have a hard time entering into this sort of very, very tight, closed community. Um, but I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah, my, I, my question was about um, kind of the social status or the class of these. You know, I mean, you said in 1966 there were 23,081. Yes. You know, <laughs> but, uh, how, I mean, that's a, you know, in terms of statistics, like, that's a really specific number, right? How, how were the Inyo, you know, like, kind of, were they classified or was there some kind of professionalization so that we knew there were... 23,081 yeah. or, or uh, so who is kind of counting the Inyo and who can be counted as an Inyo and who can't be? Like what's the kind of the... Um, okay, so this, this relates to how fishing grounds are regulated. Um, the records, I think, I think they started around the 1930s, but I couldn't access them beyond the 1960s. And you, so you have to enter the fishing cooperative. Each village has a fishing cooperative, and you have to pay dues in order to be able to earn the right to fish. It's the same thing as fishing licenses in the states, if you guys are familiar with it. Um, and so you do have, like, they do have these numbers of, of the population, even though uh, there have been people who say, oh, well, like, there's probably more than just the numbers um, because. People, like, would, they'll go out with their families, but not so much now. Uh, I think that is, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I just kind of following up on that, then are they, you, you kind of related them to the shaman in some ways, you know, I mean, these are women who, 
maybe marginalized or liberated yeah. because either their husbands died or they didn't marry. Yeah. Like the shamans, do you see them uh, have any kind of, uh, with, while they're marginalized on the one hand, they can be more kind of vocal or socially kind of liberated? Do you see yeah. the, the Hindu playing those kind of similar roles in the communities? Yeah, definitely. Um, so traditionally, uh, particularly in the Joseph dynasty, which is like, what, 900 years? Uh, <laughs> um, because there are such strict ideas about what women can do, what women can wear, Henya were considered to be among the lowest of the lowest during that period of time because they go out in these shorts and, and, and um, the, the privileged people would say, oh, those women are naked. Like, um, and, and actually, for a very long time, being a henya was something to be ashamed of. Uh, in, um, not so much now, because not so much now because it's not the Joseon dynasty anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, however, they did have more say in their communities, um, particularly as breadwinners. Um, for instance, on Jeju, it's not it's not looked down upon to divorce. It's not looked down upon to remarry. Um, in traditional Korean society, like you can't do that as a woman. You know, not so much now, but before you couldn't do that as a woman. Um, and I think that says something about how they did have something of a higher status in Jeju. Jeju, like Jeju people will tell you, Jeju is different. Um, and I think this is one of the ways in which they are different. Um, However, I, I think I will say that in a lot of the literature I found, they tend to, they tend to sort of romanticize Henya. They're like Pow! symbols of women power and, and and like feminazis and something they're not. And I, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I mean, they're they're strong women, but the way people have portrayed them as mermaids, as as like these these indomitable Amazons, I, I don't think that's correct. Um, okay. Just gave a book of a response, didn't I? Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, yes? <coughs> what made you to choose the specific uh, <coughs> village, Quido Giri, which... Oh, okay. Oh, it, um, mostly through network. <laughs> um, I spent some time at the Henya Museum, which is located in, in Hado, and, and, and I think Hado, Sahari. It's like right around the border of these two villages. And so the, the village that I came to be introduced was through Dr. Cha at the Henya Museum, and, and that's the village that I became to know more about. Um, and Kuido Iri is, um, I found out about the Henya School after I got here, and I was like, oh, I need to do that. Um, and, and because I spent so much time there, I got to know the people there as well. And, and that was largely why. <laughs> Furthermore, actually, this is probably the answer yeah, I should have given at first. Um, Hado is the most productive village in all of Jeju. Hado, Hado. There's 100 fishing villages, and it produces 10% of all of the yield on the island. That gives you an idea. Um, and so it was probably a very good place to also do research as well. But, Yes. <laughs> That's my father's birthplace. Really? Hidogiri. Wait, which neighborhood? Hidogiri <laughs> <laughs> is a small village. Oh, okay. Oh, oh okay. I thought, I thought you said home. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you don't know the fishing cop over here. Every year I go there to pay tribute to my ancestors. Oh, oh, that's so cool. <coughs> wow. <laughs> Do you have a um, practice any religion and you did you are they very religious? Um so Jeju has a very strong shaman really the uh, sort of shaman aspect to their culture. And I think you can probably call that religious um they do pay tribute to gods, so for instance, every spring there's Yongdonggut, when the Yongdong god or goddess, they're not very clear on what gender this god is. Um, but uh, 
they do pay tribute to the gods, and, and the, the divers themselves will, will also, for instance, they'll pray to the sea god for safety and for good harvest. Um, and there's probably a lot more <laughs> that I just don't know that much about because it's kind of difficult to understand these women. <laughs> Um, but yes, there is definitely a religious aspect. How closely that ties into resource stewardship has been more difficult to discover, though. So, yes. So, if with, I mean, given that most of the women are older and um, the turnover is not kind of keeping up pace with um, replacing them in this craft, then is this? then going to, I mean, is the government then going to replace it with commercial fishing methods, or what is the, I mean, or is the government at all giving any incentive for people to then become henya, or is it more tradition? Um, okay, so there's a number of things going on. One is the government is, isn't as directly interested in henya, but it is interested in money. Uh, <laughs> um, and this is related to the heavy investment in tourism on Jeju. There's a huge, huge effort to boost tourism, and Hanya have sort of become one of the the symbols. So if you go to Jeju, there's these cute pictures of, of like little Hanya with these round masks, and and they're adorable. Like, I don't think they look anything like the real Hanya. Um, <laughs> I'm really pessimistic, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so, in terms of that, I wouldn't say that they're directly trying to save Henya. However, the Jeju is also an autonomous province, um, and because of that, the people there have um, a good bit of say in what they want the money to go into. Um, and, and the fishing villages, they've been trying to do a lot of things to try to, like, bring the life back into these villages. One of them is uh, um, they've established hatcheries. Uh, because the fisheries have declined so much, they have these hatcheries where they'll, they'll raise baby abalone and they'll raise baby baby other um, the turban shells um, and, and they'll sprinkle them out into the ocean. Um, I think this ties into actually the shaman ritual where every spring they, they they ask for the god to come and sprinkle the seeds of the good harvest. Um, and that's one way in which they've been investing and trying to bring up the commercial value of fishing as a way of life. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, yeah. Well, so, it on, or historically then, was this the only fishing that like really took place on the island or were there oh. traditional like more commercial kind of okay. methods because I would imagine that the yield of you know one penya is not as much as what you would get on like a boat of yeah. fishers or yeah um, so the vast majority of fishers on Jeju are henya actually um, however there are other fishermen um, so you'll see a lot of uh, boats that focus on belt fish on squid um, on little fish called charitom, um, and and those are commercial fishermen. However, a lot of them are also migrant workers, so they come either from the mainland or they'll come from other places. Um, but but yeah, the vast majority of the fishing activity that occurs has traditionally, and I think even today, are largely the women. Uh, one last really quickly. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, during the winter months, would they still be diving? Yes. Incredible, right? Yeah. Um, actually, what's fun is uh, not that much research has been done on, done on Henya until more recently, but before, a whole bunch of people from other countries came to study the physiology of Henya. So there's a whole bunch of articles on how like there's increased blood ves vessels in, in the Henya's hands and how they use their spleen as an oxygen storage space. And, um. <laughs> so yes, yes. Uh, is there, uh, did the Henya comment, did the Henya comment on uh, any concerns about the marine ecology as a result of the military base that's being built on Xinjiang? Uh, um, oh, the military base. <laughs> um, 
So I focused on two villages that are on the north side and the military bases in a village on the southwest side. And um, those villages have largely gone. Um, I don't think the Henya really do work there as much anymore. Um, I don't quote, like, don't, don't trust me completely on that. Um, <laughs> the military base is actually very interesting because there are efforts to establish marine protected areas in Jeju. Um, however, the military base is right smack dab in the middle of those three protected areas that are that are uh, proposed, um, and sort of like the issues between damaging the ecosystem there versus protecting the fisheries because there's a huge there's a huge sort of resource I don't want to call it war but of tension um, between Korea, China, and Japan. Um, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I have a feeling that just the fisheries and protecting the waters around Korea and Jeju plays a big role into why they're so intent on having it there. Um, and I think that is it's a very complex issue. Yeah. So. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much.